from uh, Indian Association for Cultivation of Science in Kolkata. Over to you, Professor Shanti. Uh, thank you, Urna. So, uh, welcome to the second session of the third day of Statphys. And the first talk uh, of the session is by Professor Deepak Dhar. But before uh, we start that, I'm going to request Professor Ronald Dickman to introduce Deepak. And uh, uh, so, Professor Dickman, over to you. Well, thanks very much. It's really a great honor. To I think Deepak is. Uh, is not here. Uh, just one second, maybe he will come oh. back. Yeah, if there was some problem, I'm reconnecting. Uh, okay, so we have Deepak now. Yeah. Now I'm on. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, uh, as I was saying, it's it's really uh, an honor to introduce uh, Deepak Dhar, who, in principle, uh, needs no introduction. But uh, in any case, I'll, I'll tell you a few basic facts. Uh, his uh, education was at Allahabad University and uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. And then he did his PhD at Caltech. Uh, he defended his PhD in 1978. And of course, he's uh, renowned uh, in all of the physics community, especially statistical physics, for breakthrough work in self-organized criticality, interface growth, fractals, spectral, spectral dimension of fractals, uh, enumeration of animals and trees and other interesting objects that live on lattices. Uh, and I could go on, of course, but uh, this is a partial listing. Uh, I believe I first met Deepak uh, in the late 90s, probably 97. Uh, but of course, I had heard of him well before that and knew of his, uh, at least some of his research. And uh, I would say that, uh, at least to my understanding, uh, Deepak will agree with me, that uh, he's motivated in some sense by a feeling for mathematical beauty as realized in, in physical models and physical processes. But I wanted to uh, share my screen to show you one image. Let's see if I can do that. It's never easy, but I think we've got it. To show you that sometimes mathematical beauty spills over into the visual world. And this is a paper from uh, 2013, Journal of Statistical Physics. Of Deepak Dar and uh, Sadhu, um, sand pile model of proportional growth. So I recommend this article if you don't know it as a remarkable example of, of actually a rare phenomenon of proportional growth uh, in, in a mathematical model and for the really remarkable patterns that emerge uh, as this process is iterated. So let me go back to, okay, I, I think I've stopped sharing. So uh, in just uh, a couple of minutes, let me uh, thank Deepak personally for a tremendous opportunity that uh, my wife and I had to visit India, visit him while he was uh, still working at the uh, Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Uh, this was also uh, helped by a, a project uh, together with Jürgen Stilk and uh, Rajesh, Rabindar and Rajesh. Uh, and so this was really, I would say, the trip of a lifetime to be able to spend a month in Mumbai and Chennai and get to know a little bit about uh, India and Indian culture and the scientific community there. So. I thank you very much for that opportunity and of course, for all of the uh, exchanges of ideas and uh, support uh, over the years. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to, uh, I don't know if it goes back to the moderator or directly to Deepak, but 
Thanks very much. And congratulations on a very, very well-deserved award of the Boltzmann Medal. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Yes, it was a great time, you know, we had together and I also visited you in Brazil. And uh, uh, yes, uh, so in fact, I would like to thank everybody who has organized this particular session uh, and the organizers and uh, maybe then now I can start my presentation. Okay, so I decided to give a talk which is sort of a uh, review talk about, but uh, more focused on my own work than on other people's work, but some perspective on self-organized criticality after 35 years. So I realized that I have been working in this area for about that long. But it's very interesting, the past 35 years look much shorter than the future five years. But anyway, you know, so let us go on. So this is the plan of my talk. I will start with a sort of personal history of how I got into this field and, you know, how various topics developed. It is of some interest and summarize the main conclusions of my own work. But, you know, that is uh, not really going to be self-explanatory, but sort of summary of the stuff. But give a summary of what we have learned. And uh, this we means uh, including the uh, work of large number of all the other people who have worked in this general area. And then give a little bit some comments about looking forward, what can one hope to learn in the next 35 years or whatever. Okay, so let me start with my personal account. So my own encounter with self-organized criticality began with Pear Bach's visit to TIFR in Mumbai in 1988. He was going for some conference in Banaras, but you know the airplane stops in Bombay and he stopped for a day in Bombay and he gave a talk and uh, this talk was my first introduction to self-organized criticality. And in this talk, he described in his inimitable way and a lot of provocative flair. I don't know, all of you may not have heard him, but those of you who have heard him would remember that he was very um, expressive in his views. And, and so he told, that here is a theory which explains the one by F noise and mountain landscapes and the fluctuations of the river Nile and dinosaur extinctions and everything. And uh, we were listening and we were not convinced. And uh, I wanted to prove him wrong. So with Ramaswamy, Ramakrishna Ramaswamy, who was also in the in TFR at that time, in the chemical physics department, we started to read his paper more carefully and uh, then we saw what is, we fully understood what is the sand pile model that he describes there. So at that time, I was studying with Professor Barma things. In general, I was working in the area of directed percolation. And uh, the main thing which we were in our occupying our head at that time was that directionality changes the behavior of systems very strong ways. So percolation is something and directed percolation is very different, universality class is different and so on. So we felt that if you have a sand pile model, it should, if you include directional effects, that will be different. And it need, seems very reasonable because, you know, for the sand, uh, if it topples, it it goes downhill and, you know, the effect of gravity is pretty strong and it cannot be ignored. So one should worry 
about a model with directional effects and not a model like the original Bhaktang vision field model that we had defined. So we made up a model which is just a variation of the BTW model where the toppling occurs, the particles only go downward. And the picture is shown here. You, there is a sort of, sort of cylinder on which you draw a square lattice with tilted square lattice, add particles on the top layer at random. And uh, when the toppling occurs, things go down. And um, so this seems simple enough. And then we didn't know too much. So the simplest thing to do was to do some numerical simulations. But even very low level simulations seem to show that the critical density in this case is in two dimensions. So, you know, that seemed like a simple result. And then we thought maybe we can try to prove it. And proving it is actually not so hard because we use the directional property. If you look at the sides on the top layer, they are not affected by what happens below. And you can just see um, the top layer by itself. And there the sides are not even affected by each other. So it becomes very simple and you can show or you see immediately see that in the top layer, the density is half and the particles are uncorrelated. And then the proof can be extended to the next layer. It's fairly straightforward. And then you can also calculate all other properties. So this was actually it was quite straightforward. So this led to our first publication in which we sold the directed version of sand pile model exactly in all dimensions. And some sort of I show the picture and this was a nice introduction to this, my sort of getting into the subject. Then we were trying to generalize this as much as possible. So the simplest generalization one can think of is partially directed sand piles in which the, you add a particle, then the toppling things can go left, right or down, but not above. Okay, so this can be studied on finite chips of width 2, 3, 4 and uh, you can count how many configurations in the top ring are there and so on and so forth and uh, we immediately realized we, by these finite size studies that there are things called forbidden sub small Numerical, all integrations occur with equal probability in the steady state. And, uh, you know, so these were results based on finite size strips of length, height, width 2, 3, 4. And uh, we extrapolate that it holds in general. And it seemed reasonable to try to find an elegant proof of this remarkable result. That was not so immediate. But actually, it was not so hard, and it came with the realization of this abelian group structure of the model, and then you can generalize it to arbitrary graphs. And so this led to the second paper. Uh, this was a single author paper because Ramaswamy had moved to JNU, and in fact, the last parts of the first paper were ex with exchanges over email. At that time in India, the email upper bound was 30,000 kilobytes in one message. So if we had to send in, you know, a paper draft, just that take file, no figures, it had to be broken into three parts and then sent like that. It seems quite amazing that in this period now the byte and it's reached within uh, a few seconds. Okay, anyway, so this was the second work. So after this, Satya Majumdar joined and we solved the problem on the Bethelati. Then I established the connection to spanning trees problem, calculated the fraction of size with zero heights. And uh, then with Abhishek, Supriya and Slava, we worked on the variations of the Euler Walker's model, which was trying to extend the abelian property as much as possible. And uh, this was, was sort of slightly different in the beginning. We were working on this lengthen ant model where, you know, there is a lattice and there is an ant and there is a color of the square on which it sits and which way it moves depends on the color and it changes the color as it moves. It seemed like a nice model. 
and uh, Abhishek and Supriya studied this model on some torus and they came up with the result that it goes into a periodic cycle with very small period which was also very surprising result because we expected the period to be exponential in the size of the system and uh, somehow you know they came up with the proof of And then uh, I had gone to Dubna to uh, visit Slava Priyashev, uh, who unfortunately is no more. But anyway, he had independently come up with this particular model of Eulerian. We called it Eulerian locus. Later, people have called it rotor rooter model. And uh, so we wrote a paper together. And uh, the next sort of interesting work which we did was that I realized that uh, one can take the stochastic version of the sand pile model, the mana model, and that also has an abelian property if you reframe the toppling rules a little bit. But this work, it happened in 1999, so it took 10 years to realize this simple point. If you look at the final argument, it seems quite straightforward, and one might wonder why you couldn't have. You can think uh, in some way, and these things happen sort of stochastically as well. And the idea comes to you or doesn't come to you, and you can wait for very long before it happens. It's quite straight, simple. It's not very complicated, but it doesn't happen. Anyway, all the work we have done on this uh, general area was reviewed in an article in 1996, and which was then updated 10 years later in 2006. And then uh, preparing this talk, I looked up what is the total number of papers I wrote on self, somewhat related to self-organized criticality. And uh, you know, so it turns out that the number is 46. And uh, that is pretty big, but it's about one paper per year, a little bit more. So, okay, I mean, that's the way it is. But in the end, a significant amount of my own work has dealt with SOC. So, but one direction which I am personally great fondness for, which uh, Dickman actually mentioned as well, is that uh, uh, patterns formed by growing sand piles. So, this work also we kept on working for a long time. In 2002, Ostoik, a student from Switzerland, had come here and to Mumbai and uh, he stayed for one year and he wrote his thesis and later we continued working on this with um, Samar Chandra, Shubhendu Singha, Tridip Sadhu, Rahul Dandekar, Algun Shah um, and uh, you know I only show this picture of patterns formed on square lattice by adding particles at one side there is a background everything is height too and you look at what patterns you get and they are very interesting and I feel that this is a nice and rich field which can be explored much more than what we have done. Anyway, so now I change track and I will discuss uh, taking stock. What What is the status of our understanding of self-organized criticality today? And so Bach had some vision and some initial hopes and expectations to what degree have they been realized. So before you know, go into the details of this, uh, it is useful to state, summarize the key idea of self-organized criticality. So I try to do it in one sentence. It's a bit long, but still it is one sentence. So it says many non-linear dissipative slowly driven systems in nature under their own dynamics without fine tuning of control parameters reach a steady state in which you have relaxations in bursts of variable sizes and you have long range spatial and temporal correlations. So actually one could have broken it into five sentences, but I was making a rhetorical point. So I'm sort of put it, compressed it into one sentence, but it actually each of those points is very important and we will discuss them a little bit slowly, but uh, let's go on. And this is a picture 
of just a graphic picture of the so you have a sand pile model in which here is a hundred by hundred lattice you add particles at random and you monitor the outflow of sand and sometimes nothing happens sometimes there is a very big avalanche and you get a burst like activity of irregular sizes and that is a sort of typical structure of self organized critical system okay so yeah i think the key point here in the beginning is said many non linear driven systems not all non linear driven systems okay i think it is quite unreasonable to expect a theory of everything in this complex world so one would not hope to have a theory which is applicable to everything Uh, but there are many systems where it actually does work, and I'm listing them here, and you know we can go through them a little bit one by one. So there are avalanches in granular media, sand piles, which we said, you know, the basic phenomena is that there is a sand pile. You add grains slowly, and the relaxation occurs in avalanches, which are of variable sizes, and you can make a pile of sand or of rice grains or something else. and the behavior may be similar or not so similar but anyway this basic feature that there is a burst like relaxation is there to that degree i would say that it is clear clear and obvious that the sand real sand piles show self organized criticality okay then there is a, of course the starting model with you know, people you know, per bucket and discuss was earthquakes where you know you have rocks which move slowly towards each other and stress builds up and the relaxation occurs as earthquakes which are sporadic events of irregular structure one can also study brittle fracture where you take something like a piece of chalk and slowly twist it and at some point it cracks this one is not really a steady state of a system but at the time of cracking when the crack grows the growth is similar to the growth of cracks in earthquakes and so on and the problems are somewhat similar even though they are not identical but whatever one learns from one can be used in understanding the other so i put them together i would not say that the brittle fracture is a self organized critical system but you know you, it is useful in understanding or one can use the understanding of soc to understand brittle fracture rain is of course i think very nice example which christians and etel have shown and there is that um, there is atmosphere and the uh, water from the ocean keeps on evaporating into the atmosphere at a fairly steady rate on the whole because the sunlight makes the water evaporate and that is roughly constant if you average over the globe but the water out of the atmosphere onto the earth comes back but it comes sporadically as rain or snow and uh, people have shown that the size of rains measures to tably can vary over several decades and you see uh, roughly power law behavior turbulent in stirred fluid this is some very classical stuff you know studied from the time of navier stokes leonardo da vinci and so on we are taking a fluid we are stirring it regularly steadily and you see turbulence so there is some steady state of the system but where are the avalanches in this the avalanches are seen if you confine your attention to a small part of the uh, fluid then sometimes it shows lot of vorticity sometimes it shows more quiescent structure and uh, so you know so that is the that sort of the avalanche okay uh, one can take uh, stars and magnetic fields in stars and uh, you know because of that turbulence in the um, top layers um, the magnetic field lines keep on also fluctuating they are sometimes convected with the fluid and they move around and they sometimes they reconnect and rejoin and that leads to detectable effects far away and uh, you know so people study this of course pierre bach and maya pachuski in particular have studied this particular kind of phenomena uh, biological extinctions was mentioned 
by Pierbach. Stock market fluctuations is also interesting. It is fairly complicated, different system. But uh, there are a lot of interacting agents. They trade for some reason or the other. The price of individual stocks varies and they go, they show wide fluctuations. Sometimes they remain constant for a while. Sometimes they show large fluctuations. Sometimes there are huge crashes. OK, so without going into the details of the system, I would say that the stock market does show self-organized behavior. Does it show criticality? I would say yes, for a time, reasonable window of time scales of several decades, from minutes to days or years even, they show fluctuations. Uh, people have discussed neuron firings in the brain. There are different types of activities and they appear to be self-organized, of course. And uh, they are, you know, they are different. So you know, I will stop here. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the general principle outlined above, this one here, says that they go into a steady state. But uh, does not specify the relaxational mechanism that gives rise to the SOCT state. It is not part of the hypothesis that I presented to specify the relaxational mechanism. These are actually different in all the different systems we discussed um, before. So, for example, if you want, want to model solar corona, you will have to study magnetohydrodynamics and make, you know, what exactly happens, how do the magnetic lines reconnect, and deduce or guess its relaxational rules. Okay, and it seems very unlikely that the dynamical relaxation rules for magnetic field lines reconnections will look like the BTW rules for sand pile couplings. I think it will be quite foolhardy to try to blindly use sand pile model to describe the magnetic field line reconnections. So, in this sense, the SOC is not a theory, but it is a framework for building specific theories. For each particular system that we discussed before, you have to build a theory. And it is going to be substantially different from each other. But they will all share the basic principles which we outlined above. So there is some overall framework, but depending on the detailed rules. And this position is roughly agrees with the Yes. So, uh, maybe if it, it would be better if you could switch off your video because sometimes the audio is breaking. Okay. I will switch off the video. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you switch off the video? Second button in the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is coming. It is. Yeah. and uh, go back okay now is it better yes yes okay so uh, this I, this roughly agrees with the viewpoints of anderson who said that the idea of self organized criticality seems to be not the right and unique solution to all these problems but have a paradigmatic value and it is somewhat different from the viewpoint expressed by Watkins et al. in an earlier review, which said 25 years of self-organized criticality. And I've taken the figure one from there. This is the beginning of their review. And they have outlined this schematic representation of range of perceptions of SOC in literature, from the most minimal to the most visionary. So the innermost says self-tuned phase transitions and the next one hypothesis, which is broader, says all fractals are SOC. The next one says all power laws are SOC. And the, even the broader one says the contingency of nature is caused by SOC. So I think that the position that all fractals are SOC, which is the second position in this, the inner second inner one, is an extremist position and cannot be considered as viable by a reasonable person. 
so at the very least when you say all naturally acting fractals are soc because if you take something like a sierpinski cascade the way sierpinski defined it by a recursive procedure clearly there is no soc there so one cannot say that all fractals are soc is a reasonable thing but even if you were to say all naturally acting occurring fractals are soc even that is not good enough because one knows that long polymers in a good solvent are well known to have fractal structure but this is an equilibrium steady state there is no avalanche there is no relaxation you know no burst like relaxation and anything else which is related to the soc so then we go to the even outer one which say all power laws are soc so you have coulomb's law between charges and if you take some iron and iron different ions within a solution then the interaction law between them is inverse square it's independent of temperature there is no fine tuning you have to do but is that soc it becomes a matter of definition whether you call it soc or not because soc is a new word i can say by definition whenever there is a power law it is soc but that doesn't seem to be a useful thing to do because if we generalize the idea of soc too much it loses its usefulness so then we use the word power law don't you have to call it soc you know why introduce one new word when the old one will survive and so the third position is not viable and the fourth one and will not discuss much to be fair to watkins et al what they are saying is that at some time pierre bach has in his books and you express the view that this is the way it happens but i would say that you know he was the originator of some idea and his over enthusiasm for some view is allowable to some degree it's like mother's love for their own baby and but we don't have to take it seriously all the time so i think that most of the system, so looking ahead can what can we say in future i would say that most of the systems we started out to describe we have not succeeded in providing a satisfactory description so we need more realistic theories for applications we don't have a good theory of real sand piles or of real earthquakes or of real extinctions and so on there we have some models but these models are very toy model like and they are not realistic if you want realistic applications like I, in earthquakes i want to make a prediction it's not enough to have a knowledge of the probability distribution of avalanche, avalanche sizes in the large time limit you need to have much more you need to be able to make specific predictions which must consider probabilities conditioned on extra local information and the theories which people study till now don't address this issue much and so you know it needs to go much beyond what people have done so far in order to be able to do this so suppose i forget about realistic applications i would say okay but the toy models are interesting in their own right and they explain a lot of phenomena in the real world so uh, what can we say about our understanding of the toy models so i will start by saying that the paradigmatic model is taken to be the btw model of sand piles this is historically correct and perhaps fair but if you take the directed sand pile model or the loop erased box they are actually better to demonstrate the basic idea because a they are exactly soluble and b they are simpler for the btw model at some level you have to go back to numerical simulations and cannot really use the, the result strongly So, but anyway suppose we take the sand pile model they have been studied quite a lot and uh, but um, avalanche is exponents even which are the most topics of discussion have been the topics of discussion are few for um, btw model some exponents are known but for mana model and so on there are only conjectures and not really established results 
even for the two day abelian model what is the avalanche distribution what does the log conformal field theory have to say about this um, hyper uniformity was discussed in the context of mana model and so on and it is a very interesting idea and it is uh, nice that um, interesting that you know you do get sometimes you get systems with hyper uniformity sometimes you don't get them and when does it occur and how does you know that's also self-organized the hyper uniformity is self-organized and i think how it is self-organized is not well understood for other models uh, all these other models we discussed it's a, a very general question is what's a general classification scheme and possible universality classes so if i take I don't know the corona and the uh, magnetic flux reconnections. What kinds of exponents could be there, and what kinds are realized in what situation? This is not very well understood. So even in models of evolution in one D, one can find a wide variety of critical behaviors. And just as an example, I want to discuss some ongoing work with Peter Grasberger and Mohanty which is a 1D interface model. So this is just one slide of this. So we consider an interface model with non-negative integer height variable nxt. n is integer, x is integer, t is integer. It evolves in discrete time by Markov evolution. And the rule of evolution is this. nx at t plus 1 is the average of the two neighbors at previous time plus a noise variable. Now, if you take the average of these two ends, it may sometimes be half integer, sometimes it may be an integer. And so the noise is half integer if this stuff inside is odd, and it's an integer if it is even. And we'll take that it takes values plus minus half or zero plus minus one, depending on if it's odd or even. So that n is always an integer. Now, the only thing which is free of is now the probabilities of plus half, minus half, and probabilities of these and we take all it has to be independent and then you can try to say what happens in this kind of evolution of an interface which is an integer height of some 1d surface okay so we find i will not go into the details of this here but we find that for different ranges of probability parameters there are five different critical behaviors possible and this rich diversity of behavior coming in the simplest of models in its class is somewhat humbling. So like you can try to see what kinds of behaviors are there. And even for one kind of system, you find there is a lot of variety of behaviors possible. And uh, I think for many of these, this has not been understood. So finally, I want to make a short tribute to Pear Bach. And uh, because his original ideas started this area of research and also um, guided much of my own work in this area. And uh, I would like to mention a truly remarkable observation which was made by Bach um, just a few weeks before he died in one of his last papers, which had not received as much attention as it deserves, perhaps because Pear Bach was not present and was not there to present it forcefully. Okay, so let me just first describe the thing. So we know that there is the universe and we are discussing with the large scale structure of the universe. So there are galaxies. And uh, if you look at uh, small scale, which is the scale of separation of galaxies, then galaxies are like point objects and they are separated in space. So the, you know, the dimension of the universe is kind of zero dimensional. But if you go into bigger sizes, then it is well known that there are these cosmic strings, there's galaxies kind of form strings, and at even bigger scale, they kind of form sheets, and at a larger scale, uh, they become homogeneous, and the effective dimension as defined by the rate at which the mass increases as a function of radius becomes 3. So they propose a very simple formula, d effective at scale l, is linearly proportional to log L and log L by L0, L0 is the scale of the separation between galaxies. Then when L0, L is of the order of L0, this dimension is zero. When L is L max, which is the maximum size of the universe, this becomes three. And it linearly interpolates between these two values. 
views and um, seems to describe the real data quite well. And uh, but there is no theory which uh, no plausible theory which actually gives you this kind of a dependence of dimension on the length scale. So the good explanation of this is still lacking. <coughs> Excuse me. And finding this explanation would be a great tribute to Perbag. Okay, so I would like to stop there. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Deepak, for a very nice talk. And we will take some questions and comments. But before, uh, so maybe uh, people can raise hand. But before that, let me just point out uh, one question that came from the YouTube uh, from uh, Nilanjana Sengupta. So her question is that uh, could you please explain how SOC Mm -hmm. with entropy maximization for a spontaneously evolving system? Uh, sorry, so SOC goes into a steady state. I don't know if it's a maximum entropy state because it is not the, it is a steady state, but it is not necessarily a maximum entropy state. Let me say, in fact, it is often not the maximum entropy state. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, if anybody has a okay, so one raised hand from SN Bosch Center, who is that PK? Or no, no, sorry, Shokuntala or no. oh, Shokuntala? Yeah, please go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, you have shown the figures of the patterns formed on the square lattice by adding particles at the origin. Yeah. In the first portion. And uh, in this case, I am asking whether the fractal dimension of that structure remains same when we add more particles. Uh, so, what I discussed was that the pattern remains the same. Uh, the fractal dimension of the pattern would usually be called 2 because, you know, the mass increases as the square of the radius. So, it is not a fractal, it is a compact object. But it has a interesting non-trivial pattern, and we were studying the actual structure of the pattern that it has four petals, kind of shape, and so on and so forth. The fractal dimension of the pattern is more or less trivial in this case. In some other cases, we found non-trivial fractal patterns, but their fractal dimension could not be computed theoretically. Only numerical estimates are available. Thank you. Okay. Uh any other questions? Anybody? Uh, Arnob, please go ahead. I see yeah. you have raised your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Deepak. Uh, do you know an Hi. example where interacting quantum particles goes to a self organized state or something like that? Just purely by quantum dynamics? Okay. I mean, I. Uh... If you call a superconducting state as a self-organized state, then of course they go there, right? And uh, but uh, these have not been studied in this way quite a lot because the models people discussed are usually classical mechanical models because we are discussing with macroscopic world. And so mm -hmm. quantum effects are usually not very important and they have not been discussed in great detail. Okay, thank you very much. Not able to answer it much more satisfactorily. Thank you very much. Okay, okay uh, more questions? Well, uh, if not, uh, let's thank Deepak for a very, very nice talk and uh, thank you. So, thank uh, you. So, so break, break, break out rooms. I'm sorry. 